Um, I'm just going to talk through some of the terms that we'll be going, you'll be hearing over and over again through the day. And I imagine there's a large uh, number of you who know a lot of this significantly more than I do. So bear with me, but I'm just hoping there's some people in here for whom this is a bit of a, um, who need an introduction. Um, okay, so the first keywords we're looking at here is left and right, very important. Um, but this is one of the shots that um, we'll be working on during the day. And it's just what I'm using as a reference here to just describe some terminology before we start. This is a useful diagram for me um, in terms of um, some words about what we're talking, uh, stereo terms. Um, we've got positive parallax, negative parallax, and this thing here called a disparity field. Um, the disparity field is a measure of how far a pixel travels between the left view and the right view. So it's a measure of the offset between the two views on a per pixel basis. I've actually cheated on this shot because in fact this shot actually doesn't have as much positive parallax and negative parallax um, as I've shown here. I've actually reconverged this shot um, to make it look more fun. The strength of the disparity field kind of shows how, how, um, how much a pixel travels between left view and right view. We've got ne negative parallax, which is what comes out in front of the screen at the audience. Then the positive parallax in the background is what sits behind the screen plane. Um, I've got some diagrams, quite simplistic diagrams, which kind of explain this. So if we're looking here on this particular shot, if we were viewing this in stereo, the way I've reconverged this, the characters in the foreground would be standing out um, in front of the screen. And the far background where the green screen is would in fact be perceived as being behind the screen and somewhere on the street in the middle would in fact be, basically, you would perceive that as being on the screen plane. So this is, um, the screen plane is zero parallax, which is on the boundary between our red and blue in the picture. Um, objects at that point perceived to be on the screen plane. And if you were in a comp sliding your left image over your right image, the, the convergence points would be where the images line up with each other. We have stuff then in front of the screen, so it's the red pixels here on the disparity mapping. Um, negative parallax, the right eye pixels, the left of the left eye pixels. Um, and so again, um, on my diagram, you can kind of see how this works. So objects which are arranged in this fashion on the image tend to appear in front of the screen plane. Then obviously, positive parallax, the blue layer, these are objects behind the screen. The trick I played with convergence is a thing you'll hear a lot. So the convergence point, i.e. what tends to lie, be perceived as being on the screen plane, you can, you can fix this in post by doing a horizontal move between the two images basically just to change whereabouts the images line up, and this changes how they are perceived. Things to avoid, because these will happen to you a lot once you start getting into uh, doing stereo work. Excessive par positive parallax is hard for the eye to fuse. So basically, this is the point where um, your audience's eyes are required to pop out slightly sideways, um, and apparently this is slightly uncomfortable. Um, so avoiding this. So this is basically you're watching out for disparities on the background for stuff that lies behind the screen plane. Um, and there's rules of thumb, thumb as to what you can actually get away with. And there's also the, um, the reverse is also true, which is that um, stuff that is, comes way out in front of the audience is also kind of hard to fuse. Um, interesting note here is that, um, for those of you who haven't looked at this kind of stuff before, is that in stereo viewing, your eye focus is actually always on the screen. So it's not exactly the same as being in a true 3D environment. Um, and um, although you're focused on the screen, your eyes are actually converging on a point when you're trying to focus on one of these spears stabbing out into the audience um, on a point that's actually way in front of the point you're actually focusing on. Another thing that's that comes up fairly frequently, and I guess this kind of links into uh, questions people often ask on what do we view stereo material on when we're doing comps, um, is the difference between the, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a stereo monitor to do your viewing on, how does what you perceive on a workstation um, vary when you actually get into a cinema? And again, this is my simplistic diagram um, for someone with an extremely large head. Um, looking at a screen, this is like a top-down view of what, you'd be look, what, what, what the um, geometry might look like. A cinema is more like this, so effectively the eyes are closer together in terms of their relationship to the screen size. So this is you looking at your workstation, this is you in a theatre. And you can see that the, um, the point where you perceive the object, i.e. Where, where these lines I've drawn here cross over, varies depending on the viewing geometry. There is actually no real uh, decent way of actually viewing the intended effect without actually being in the environment that you're supposed to be viewing it in. So when you're doing stereo work, the best place to view how it actually looks is in a theatre. Um, if it's work that's actually intended for screening in someone's TV, on someone's TV in their front room, then the best environment to um, evaluate it 
is um, with that kind of smaller geometry. Um, this actually does make onset monitoring tricky. So um, it's, it's quite common for people who are doing onset viewing with fairly small monitors to have uh, a different impression of what they're, actually, uh, what they're actually viewing compared to how it will end up in a cinema. So getting all this geometry right in post requires a little planning. Um, and if you're lucky, this is immensely helped by the production team getting the shoot right. So getting people who actually know what they're doing will save an enormous amount of pain um, afterwards. Um, problems in the shoot, there are no easy fixes for anything really beyond fixing the convergence points. Um, and also um, other small items as well, like dealing with camera misalignment. But actual failures to correctly appreciate the geometry of the cameras relative to the scene and what you're actually trying to shoot is actually really, really hard um, to correct later. Some other terms that you hear a lot, um, parallel shooting versus converged shooting. There's a bit of a religious war. If you actually subscribe to any of the cinematographers' lists on 3D shooting, you'll find that... Um, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a great divide between people who shoot parallel and people who shoot converging. Um, obviously, we kind of sit on the fence. Parallel shooting, the cameras are arranged, that, arranged so their optical axes are parallel. Um, convergence is then a process that happens in post. One of the advantages of this is there's no keystoning between the eyes, so both, both views um, um, tend to see the same object square in both views. Um, because you converge in post, you can lose some image width in convergence, so you kind of need extra image assets left and right in order to do your image sliding for convergence. On the converged shooters, um, you can still obviously tweak the convergence in post if you're not happy with what was actually shot on set. Um, you do suffer from some mild keystoning effects between views, um, but the advantage again is that you can usually keep the full capture width because your requirement for reconverging later is actually fairly small. The key thing here being interaxial separation between the cameras, which you'll hear a lot about. This is one of the things that not getting right in the shoot is, in fact, one of the um, mistakes that will cost you in post um, a huge amount of time and effort. Another thing you'll hear a lot, mirror or prism rigs. Um, camera bodies are fairly fat um, by their nature, so if you're going to get two red cameras and sellotape them together, the actual um, separation between the optical axes of the camera is actually fairly large, and this really limits the kind of shooting you might want to do, particularly for close-up work. So typically, a more sophisticated setup is chosen using a mirror or a prism, which allows the cameras to be arranged in a fashion where you can actually get the optical axes really close, or in fact, even on top of each other if you need to. And this allows you to avoid things like um, excessive interaxial separation of the cameras, avoiding excessive disparities, therefore, um, in the two views. Um, has the effect that reflection polarizes the light in one view, um, which we'll be coming on to later in the day. Um, doesn't affect whether you're shooting parallel or converged, though. Um, and I threw this one in um, last minute because someone asked about it. Um, you, you, uh, sorry about the footage. It's a bit poor. <laughs> um, a left view and a right view. Um, and um, actually, the reason for these being stick figures is I tried to work out what I meant by this on the train by using my fingers and closing one eye another and winking at the people opposite me. <laughs> so those are my fingers. Obviously, stuff leaves the shot. Um, in this particular example... Um, what we're saying here is the character on the left of the shots, the foreground character, um, is set up in such a way that it's perceived as being in front of the screen, which is fine. Um, it's also slightly exiting the screen, and this is, there's, there's, there's kind of two interesting things going on here. One is that um, it's, uh, the visibility of it in one eye compared to the other eye is slightly different, and in fact your eye is actually pretty good at making up for this because your eyes are very used to things being behind other things. Um, having only one view or a partial view of an object is usually not a problem for you. Um, but um, kind of related to that is the fact that if you imagine these characters hanging in the space in front of you, the character appears to be slightly cut off, and it's cut off by something that, the, that isn't actually in front of you. So it's actually been cut off by the edge of the screen that's actually lying behind the character. Um, and some people find this faintly disturbing. A classic way of getting around this is you can imagine rendering your own... Um, viewing window, which sits in space in front of um, all the action that's going on. So we can still have action on the screen, action in front of the screen, and where there are these edge violations, we can actually just screen them off by introducing a border, um, which lives in front of the action. And there's no, real, uh, there's no real reason why this actually has to be anything like what I've drawn here. It can actually just be uh, simply cropping in at one edge. You can rotate the window any way you like. You can probably make it a fancy shape. Um, but this is the kind of thing... Um, referred to as floating windows um, to cope with edge violations. So I think that's pretty much a run through what we think is most of the, um, the basic terminology. Um, so that's the end of the beginning. Thank you. <laughs>